Good evening, everyone. I am RCDSO Registrar and CEO, Dan Faulkner. And with me is our new RCDSO President, Dr. Harinder Sandhu. I wanna welcome you to the first virtual member town hall of 2023, RCDSO Connect. I appreciate you taking time from your busy schedules to hear directly from me, Harinder and others. To begin, I would like to recognize the complexity and privilege of gathering online today by sharing a land acknowledgement from the Government of Canada. We acknowledge that we are joining this meeting from the traditional territories of many nations and that these lands are home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. I invite us all to recognize the traditional territories of the lands from which we are joining this meeting. Thank you. So we build these sessions around topics that are of interest to dentists. And you'll have an opportunity to participate in a poll at the end of this session to suggest improvements and future topics. As you noted previously, I'm sure, this sold out session is eligible for a category two CE point. You're going to receive a reference code from me at the end of the session, and we'll be asked for it as part of our post event survey to verify your attendance here today. We do these sessions to connect with dentists and to keep you informed and up to date with the college's work. This is just one way we communicate. We're also quite active on social media. We post regularly on our website. We send out newsletters and council updates, as well as e-blasts to the profession and to stakeholders. Our Connect sessions are also posted to our YouTube channel. I encourage you to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get alerts for our videos, news, and resources. Tonight, our aim is to introduce you to our new president, though I'm sure many of you know him. We're also going to provide guidance on cybersecurity and update you on some exciting upcoming e-portfolio news. And we'll address many of the questions you submitted through the event registration. So with that, we'd like to get this event started by asking all of you a question. We always look forward to hearing from our participants. And to do that, we've been using a live polling tool called Slido. On your smartphone, your computer, or your tablet, please open your web browser. Now you can go to www.slido.com and enter the event code, which is 955-8377. You can also scan the QR code on screen to participate. We will be polling you on a number of issues this evening, so please keep your devices close by. So let's get started with our first question. The first question is what drew you to this session the most? So you can see that we are adding, tabulating as we go along. In the top right, we're looking at uh, a number of 24 respondents so far. I think we have about 200, close to 200 participants on the webinar. We're gonna give it a few seconds while you continue to enter what drew you to this session the most. <clears throat> and as we often do, we will uh, ensure that the final result is uh, available and provided. So we've got just over 80 responses now, and it looks like the college updates is about 40% uh, of the draw for you and learning about cybersecurity coming in second at around 23, 24%. And the CE point uh, is uh, obviously a draw, but uh, certainly the content has uh, held your attention as well. So thank you very much. Keep entering your data. We will uh, be able to tabulate the results as we go along. And with that, I'd like to move to our first presentation of the evening. Aldwin Armstrong is the college's director of information technology, IT. He's responsible for managing all aspects of IT service delivery at the college, from developing our strategic plans and related annual tactical roadmaps to manage IT operations. Aldo is going to focus tonight on a couple of really important topics, including how to reduce cybersecurity risk and best practices for electronic records management. Aldo, over to you. Thank you so very much, Dan. 
Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And as Dad has stated, we're going to go over cybersecurity and electronic records management. Now, it may seem to be very security heavy, but that's primarily because uh, think of your electronic records as the crown jewels within your castle. And you'll get that reference as we go along. Next slide, please. So uh, today we'll go over uh, a few topics. We'll talk about the threat landscape. We will talk about what you can do uh, with this information. We're gonna go over some of the questions that were submitted uh, prior to this session, as well as some resources uh, that are available to you. If you can, uh, next two slides, yeah. What you're seeing on your screen is a list of companies, and we're not putting them here to name or shame them. What you're seeing are a sample of companies that had cybersecurity breaches in 2022. And I say sample because there's a lot more companies uh, that uh, were breached in 2022. Why you're seeing this as well is because it doesn't matter the size of the organization. A security breach is possible and in some cases inevitable. So you need to understand that this is a threat to all organizations regardless of size. Uh, next slide, please. In 2012, one of the statements that were, was frequently made was that there are two types of companies those who have been hacked and those who will be hacked. Now, over the last few years, that has evolved into two companies, two types of companies, those who have been hacked and those who don't know they have been hacked. It, it sounds scary and quite frankly, that's because it is. Most organizations will experience a cybersecurity event. If you think you've never experienced a cybersecurity event, that should be more concerning to you. Uh, because a cybersecurity event isn't just that your entire computer was wiped out by ransomware. Uh, you could experience phishing emails that have gotten in and so on and so forth. So uh, this second statement is more in line with how uh, folks within the IT sector see security uh, today. And next slide, please. Often we're asked, why are these people out there doing this? Don't they have anything better to do? And the, the answer is in large part because of money. In 2022, it's predicted that the cost of cybercrime, not just the amount of money that's paid out for ransomware and so on and so forth, but the total cost of, uh, of cybercrime from reputational harm to loss of revenue and so on and so forth, was equal to approximately 8.44 trillion US dollars. So we're not talking about a small amount of money. We're not talking about a small economic impact. We're talking about significant economic impact. And quite a bit of that, does actually go back to these threat actors. So there's a financial uh, benefit for them to do these cyber crimes. And so that's another reason why you have to be very much aware of what's happening. Uh, next slide, please. And we're gonna jump into a poll. And this poll is in 2021, what percentage of North American internet users do you think had their accounts breached? We're seeing approximately 95 respondents. I'll just give a second or two more. I'm seeing 50% at 30 uh, there. I'm seeing 80%. And next slide, please. So please continue the, 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 the voting. In 2021, the stats actually show us that one in two North Americans had their accounts breached. Now that's the reported stats. The real numbers are closer to 80%. And we know that because as we're going to get into this, your account being breached doesn't mean that your device has been breached. Your account could be breached from so many different sources. So the, the accurate number is hard to really hammer down. But while the stats say one and two, you're right. A lot of people in the sector uh, assume it's greater than that, most likely around the 80% mark. In North America, ransomware makes up approximately 30% of attacks. And most of you have heard about some ransomware event. This is where someone's gotten into your systems and they've encrypted your computers and very much like kidnapping, they say, pay us money and we will give you back your systems. It is particularly important uh, for this group on this poll and we'll talk about it in a bit, but that is a significant portion of attacks in North America. And another large uh, type of attack is business email compromise or account takeover. This is where someone's gotten into your system and actually taken over your account. Could be your personal account, could be your professional account. And why that matters is because increasingly that line between personal and professional is blurring. 
And so by taking over your personal account, there's a lot more harm that I can do in your professional life than we used to be able to do. So these are some important pieces that you have to be aware of. Next slide, please. When we look at attack trends in 2022, approximately 40% of attack uh, trends now occur indirectly. So you've heard about supply chain over the last little while, supply chain shortages and so on and so forth. Now I'm hearing about supply chain as an attack vector. Yes, increasingly the world has become interconnected. So no longer are you islands of information that just have to worry about your own borders. You now deal with uh, different manufacturers of software, of hardware, of a number of solutions. And what we're seeing is that instead of breaching every individual company, most threat actors are now attacking the source of some of these uh, this equipment that we use. And by attacking the source, they can impact all the customers. So supply chain vulnerabilities, supply chain attacks is a growing threat out there. So what this means is that you know, not only do you have to be aware of what you're doing to protect your entire environment, but you also have to be aware of which supply chain vendors you're using and what threats have been reported about them and what you need, what action you need to take to mitigate some of those threats. One of the most important uh, points that I'd like you to take away from this piece around the threat landscape is that in 2022, 82% of breaches against businesses had a human element to it. And this is a critical piece. It, it really goes back to, we can roll out as much technology as we want. The human element is a critical factor in how we protect against cybersecurity. But of course we had to mention phishing. Phishing continues to be the number one entry point for most cyber attacks. Most ransomware will start from a phishing email. Most other credential thefts will start from a phishing email. So phishing attacks continues to be one of the most common uh, entry points for cyber threats that we face today. And next slide, please. And on this slide, we're really talking about specifically healthcare. Healthcare has been a significant target for ransomware. And unfortunately, we've seen that right here in Canada as well. And people are saying, don't they, again, don't they have anything better to do? We're doing good works. Why are they targeting us? It's an easy target. Number one, the information that you have within your practice is the holy trinity. We talk about personal health information or patient health information. You know all the health information about your patients, not just their oral health, but oftentimes you ask about their, their other medical history. You also have their personal identifiable information, you know their address, their date of birth, all the sensitive information that's not health related. And in most cases, you also have their credit card information, so payment information. So you have PHI, PII, and PCI data. As I said, the holy trinity of information that someone would need to steal someone's identity or to exploit someone. So the information that's kept within the healthcare sector is extremely valuable to these threat actors out there for a number of reasons. An additional reason why healthcare continues to be a target is that in healthcare, the technology isn't really a primary focus. So protecting the technology and the systems and so on, oftentimes it is overlooked. And we saw that this isn't something that's new. This has been an ongoing issue within the healthcare sector for a number of years. And some people say, well, of course, I'm a doctor. I'm not an IT person. I understand that. But this threat impacts your ability to practice as well, too. So be aware that if you're not looking at the solutions that you're using or the technology that you're using, in addition to your practice, this poses a risk as well. And last but not least is once a threat happens or once your system is encrypted, Healthcare uh, systems tend to pay up. And why is that? If I'm in a sales company and someone's lost a couple of sales leads, I can go back out and re-engage with folks. In the healthcare sector, a lot of our records, the patient, the treatment plans and so on and so forth are kept in these records. So they're highly sensitive to our ability to deliver the service. So in, in more times than I'd like to see, healthcare providers are actually paying the ransom to recover some of this data. And while I don't recommend paying, I know that it's not realistic to say you should never pay. So this is another reason why healthcare continues to be a, a target for ransomware, because it's an easy target. So let's jump down to uh, the, the threat actors, please. So next slide. Normally when people think about the threat actors or the bad actors, whatever you want to talk about, the people who are trying to access your system, they seem to have this picture of uh, some person sitting in a basement trying to hack into your system. Gone are those days where those are the only threat actors. As you can see on your screen, we have threat actors that 
span the, 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 the span so many different sectors from geopolitical to nation states all the way down to thrill seekers. And that threat actor at the bottom there, that insider threat is an increasingly serious thing that most organizations will need to, to consider. Insider threat actors can be accidental or intentional. Accidental threat actors could be, I'm bored, I don't have anything to do right now, let me download this flappy bird on my computer so I can play around. Guess what, that flappy bird has uh, ransomware, it can encrypt your system or steal the data. Accidental threat actor, but it's still a threat actor. Intentional threat actor, I have a problem against this patient or I have a problem against this dentist. Let me steal this information or let me have introduce something into the system that will affect the practice. The, the importance of understanding what inside actors could do and could how they could affect your practice is critically important. So don't overlook the insider threat as well. Next slide, please. Lessons learned thus far. We spoke about people uh, before and that 82% of the breaches are due to people. And that is absolutely a lesson that we need to learn. Cybersecurity is about people, not the technology. But you just said you're not protecting the technology. I understand. But if I get a computer that has nothing on it and someone puts ransomware on it, I could either rebuild it or I can go to Best Buy and buy another one. If someone encrypts all my patient records, I can't go to Best Buy and buy new records. So it's less about the technology and more about the people and the organization and the information that you have. And with that in mind, you have to also then understand that cybersecurity cannot be solved by technology. You can't spend your way out of the cybersecurity threat. It doesn't matter how many technology suites you put up there. It doesn't mean that you don't have to invest in the right technology, but you can't put up enough technology suites to, to address cybersecurity in its entirety. You do need the, the individual involvement to be able to achieve uh, better results. So we talked about the threat landscape, and now we're going to look at some of the things that you can do. And we're going to jump around a little bit here, and we'll start this off with a poll. So if you can go to the next slide, please. And we'll ask the question about the retention periods. And this is a question we hear quite frequently. Oh, how long should I keep my electronic records? So the question here is, which has a longer retention period? Physical, electronic, or the same? We're seeing a number of people coming in. A lot of people are, are putting in same, followed by electronic, followed by physical. Around 88, sorry, 94 responders thus far. We're at 101. Please, you can continue to vote. We'll go to the next slide, uh, please. And a key clarification is a record is a record is a record. And this is directly from our uh, dental records keeping uh, uh, standard. A record is a record regardless of form or medium. And what that means is that we need to get out of the mindset of thinking about electronic records as being any different from our physical records. The same requirements about completeness, integrity, and so on and so forth apply to both, including the retention periods. They are your records, regardless of the medium and the form that they take. Uh, next slide, please. Now, another question that we've, we've gotten, and we talk about all these threat actors and so on and so forth, is how do we know that we've been hacked and that we're doing enough to prevent this from happening? And I love this question, and I think this is a question that every single person around this table should ask on a regular basis. And the answer is, you know it by doing periodic security assessments. Think of it in the context of oral hygiene. It doesn't matter how well I brush or floss. We still say you need to do your regular checkups. Consider your periodic security assessment as your cybersecurity checkup. You get a trusted firm to come in and do an assessment of what's there, and they can identify holes that you may need to fix, uh, cavities, or they may identify issues that you, uh, longer term or bigger issues that you need to address. And so you need to do these periodic security assessments just to ensure that you know, have I been hacked? Or are there opportunities for me to hack if I don't take action quickly? And don't be afraid of exposing the holes. Cybersecurity is an exercise in continuous improvement. You'll not get it perfect right away and don't expect it to be. You will always be improving because as technology changes, as the threats change, you need to adapt to those changes. So think about security, cybersecurity and the protection as a, an exercise in continuous improvement. Next slide, please. 
Now, in order for you to protect yourself and to protect your practice, you need to know your responsibilities. And we're gonna jump uh, to a poll in a second, but on the screen are just some of the areas that you're responsible, that, or a piece of legislation from PEPIDA to PHIPA to RHPA to our own guidelines. Know what is expected of you as you practice dentistry. Next slide, please. And we'll jump into another poll. And this poll is really talking about your security policy. So do you have an up-to-date security policy for your practice? Yes, no, not sure. And when I mean up-to-date, I'm not talking about something that was written 10 years ago and we're gonna review it in the next 10 years. A security policy needs to be looked at regularly, once a year or so. Okay, we're at 90%. Once we get to 100, we'll jump to the answer and so on. So yeah, let's go to the next slide. Please continue to vote. The answer is you need to have one. And this is part of our electronic records management standard as well. As a dentist, you must assume responsibility. You have to have a security policy that has the details around the roles, the responsibilities of not just your staff, but of those third-party contractors and anybody else that's gonna have access to your electronic records management system. We talk about this in the context of not just protecting the day-to-day -day users, but also your supply chain folks. If you have another source that's gonna be accessing your system to pull patient records, understand what they're doing with those records, understand who will have access to those records, understand how they're protecting those records themselves. So you need to have an up-to-date policy and you need to ensure that it's not just window dressing, you have a policy and that you've disseminated it across your practice and everyone is aware of what is in it and what their responsibilities and roles are as per that policy. Let's jump down, please. Next slide. But a security policy takes a long time. You went to school for decades to learn this. Yes, but you don't have to start from scratch. My recommendation is if you don't have a security policy or if you do have a security policy, have a look at some of the more common cybersecurity uh, frameworks that are, that are out there. They're great guides for writing a policy and for understanding the questions you need to ask. Uh, at the college, we use the NIST cybersecurity framework. That's the one on the top left as a guide for our security framework. But that's not the only one that's out there. There's so many other standards. And the great thing about this, a lot of these frameworks are free and they have toolkits or templates that you can use to learn more and to draft that, uh, that policy. Next slide, please. Now that you have a policy that lays out the roles and responsibility, it's time to look at how you deploy your security. Security isn't flat. Uh, what you're looking at is something called the defense and depth methodology. And that's, again, something that the college uses when we deploy your security. It's often referred to as the castle defense. Uh, for those of you who have uh, spoken to me before, you know that I like talking about castles because it's a great way of looking at security. Think about those things that are important to you as your crown jewels. As with any castle, you put the crown jewels in the most secure location within your castle, and then you build up the layers of defense. Even if your castle is breached, the more layers of defense you have, the more time you have to either move the crown jewels if needed or to address the breach and those threat actors before they get to your crown jewels. So we use the defense in depth approach because it allows us to look at our entire environment in layers, almost like an onion, and add the appropriate levels of security to slow down or stop those threat actors before they get to our crown jewels, which is our data, our information, our records. Next slide, please. We're gonna go into a bit of a rapid fire session. I'm looking at the time here and we're gonna look at some of the hygiene pieces that you can take. So I'm not gonna read all of these. We'll make sure that this is available to you. One of the first things that you need to think about is know where your records are stored. You may assume that you know where your records are stored, but know where your records are stored. If you use an iPhone or anything else in your practice and that iPhone is backed up to iCloud, guess what? Your records are now in iCloud. So be fully aware of where your records are stored and take the appropriate action to secure your records regardless of where they're stored. The second one is something that I've heard so much about in practice, control access to patient records. I know it's easy to share username and passwords. It makes it, our life so much easier, but please don't do this. As I stated before, the physical records management piece and the electronic records management piece has the same requirements. So it's hard for me to uh, guarantee the integrity of our records if I can't say that you are the person that edited this record. 
And you cannot then come back to us and say, well, we share the same password. This person may have done it. You are accountable for it. So in your practices, do not share logging information that access your electronic records, please. Uh, multi-factor authentication. I had a question on, about this. We know that people have been bypassing multi-factor authentication. Should we still use it? Absolutely. I know that there's so many people out there will tell you, well, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. It's better to have multi-factor authentication in place. It is such a critical piece to slow down the attack that we strongly recommend uh, multi-factor authentication. Next slide, please. Another piece that we have been looking at recently is in several practices, there's often a guest Wi-Fi that's provided for your patient's comfort and usability. It's important that if you have this in your practice, you've separated it out from your network that contains your electronic records management and other corporate information. For those of you who visited the college, I know it's frustrating, but you come into the college, we have a guest network that lasts for 24 hours and then you no longer have access. And then we have the regular network that accesses our systems. It's important to separate them because you don't have to necessarily be sitting in your practice to access your guest network. And you don't want a threat actor to sit outside of your physical space where you, can, you cannot see them and just have an unlimited time trying to access your system. So separate your, your networks. Be vigilant with email. We talk about phishing being that great entry point for a lot of threats. Absolutely. So you need to be vigilant about email. You need to be cautious about what you're clicking on. And the one at the bottom is also an important piece. We got the quest, this question as well. How do I send uh, x-rays and other patient information? As per the IPC, anytime you're sending uh, patient information, it must be encrypted. There's several solutions out there that will allow you to send encrypted messages. But if you're sending patient information, it needs to be encrypted. Next slide, please. Train, train, train. As I stated before, having a security policy is great, but if you're not training your folks how to use it and what to do and what to look for in those emails, it is not going to be very effective. Cybersecurity training is one of the most critical things that I think that every single organization should have. At the RCDSO, we do monthly training for everybody across the board. So cybersecurity training would be one of the biggest things I would recommend. And there are a lot of programs out there that allows you to do this, but train your folks on a regular basis. Next slide, please. Have a response plan. We stated at the beginning that there's only two types of companies, those who have been hacked or those who don't know that they've been hacked. Well, based on that, you know an emergency is coming. Plan for that emergency before it happens. Uh, in the midst of that emergency is not the time to figure out what is happening. So as you're going through that, please have this plan. You can Google our response plan and you'll see it there. I'm gonna jump down uh, to the next question, next two slides, please, just to try and address some questions. Uh, some of the other questions we had was around what is the best program? There's no real best program. Use a notable brand for your security products. Uh, for those of you who think I have a Mac, I don't have to worry. That's not the truth. Uh, Mac, PC, Linux, Android, they're all the same. Uh, so please be aware you need the, the appropriate piece. AI, that's something that a lot of people have asked about as well. Will AI make the world more dangerous? The answer is yes and no. With great power comes great responsibility. Uh, it's a tool. So uh, at the college, we use an endpoint uh, protection system that supposedly has some AI components in it to protect the environment. Threat actors are also using AI to make the phishing emails more effective. So AI can be used in both ways. So please, uh, please be aware of that. Uh, next slide, please. On the screen, I think this is the, the last, my last slide. These are just some of the resources that are available to you from the Canadian Ca Center for Cybersecurity, uh, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. We'll make these available uh, to you as well, but you're not in this alone and you don't have to start from scratch. There are a lot of resources that are out there to support you, including our very own practice advisory service. So with that, I wanna say thank you so very much uh, for your time today and I'll uh, turn it back over to Dan. Aldwin, thank you very much for that. That uh, provided some really interesting data about cybersecurity for our participants tonight. And uh, I know it also prevent, uh, presented some really helpful advice. 
uh, for dentists who are trying to manage this every day in their practice. So thank you again, Aldwin. As many of you know, 2022 was an election year for the RCDSO Council. Voting for the 2023 to 2025 Council took place in December of 2022. And we've welcomed five new dentists to Council and seven returning Council members. In January, the entire Council gathered to elect its Executive Committee for the next two years. And that included the President and the Vice President. And we live streamed this meeting on YouTube. Dr. Nalan Bargava, David Bishop, and Dr. Aram Walker were elected to serve on the executive. And our first non-dentist public member and an experienced council member, Mark Trudell, was elected to be the vice president. And of course, today is an opportunity to have a, a preliminary discussion with our new president, Dr. Harinder Sandhu. I have a couple of questions to help you to get to know Harinder. Uh, Dr. Sandhu has been the vice dean and director of Shulik Dentistry, Western University. He's a champion of access to care and other issues, especially uh, uh, serving underserved populations and serving physically and developmentally challenged patients. He's also very well published and continues to research and see patients today. And some or many of you in the audience may know him by your attendance at Western and his uh, role there as an educator. Harinder, welcome. You Thank you, Dan. You're an internationally trained dentist. Uh, you've also led one of the preeminent education programs for dentistry in Canada. Tell us how you brought these two perspectives on education together. Thank you, Dan, and good evening, everybody. And uh, I know that I've met many of you over the years, and I'm very, very honored to be elected president of the Royal College of Dental Surgeons of Ontario, and it's a great to be here. Yes, I'm a foreign graduate. Uh, I got my initial dental degree from Guru Nanak University in India, a PhD in anatomy from University of Ottawa, and especially training in periodontics from Loma Linda University. So I've gone to three different uh, countries for education, and I know how difficult it is to come back and uh, go through all the requirements uh, to practice in Ontario. There are challenges which many of you might have faced, but it is not um, uh, something which is insurmountable. Um, in 2007, uh, I piloted a proposal through University of Western Ontario to grant DDS degree to internationally trained dentists. And then all the university in North America followed that and adopted that process. And all of them got get now DDS. One of the other things what I did was unique at Western was that we provided or awarded retroactive DDS to some of the people who have graduated with a certificate of completion in previous 10 years. So, <clears throat> Uh, as uh, Dan has mentioned, I am advocate for access to care, and that is our one of the strategic priority. And uh, I am very happy that uh, we are working on it. Thanks, Harinder. Uh, lots of really important perspectives that you're bringing to the table, and and certainly a lot of uh, live topic uh, topics and issues that uh, we will be. Um, looking at more closely and carefully and providing lots more information to the profession and the public. My next question is about the, the college's mandate in public protection. Can you tell us a little bit about your perspective on public protection, what that means to you? Now, again, thank you for asking this question. I believe that proper public protection is achieved through collaboration between communities, community leaders, regulators, and the professional members. It must be a collaborative effort. An adversarial relationship between members and regulators is a recipe for failure in public protection. So that, that is uh, one of the main um, trust colleges working on communicating with members. And that's why we have these uh, uh, RCDSO Connect sessions. And that is why transparency is so important. What happens at college and committees must be transparent and fair. The college makes great effort in this regard and I encourage you to read the 
newsletters and even watch council minutes, which are uh, uh, meetings or uh, newsletter and even watch council meetings if you are interested because they are uh, tele, uh, they are they are they are live meetings. Public can attend. You can attend. If you watch our live streamed meetings, you will see that we put the public interest first. And that is at the core of every decision we make, every discussion we have. We get there with constructive, collaborative discussion. Uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us uh, over the next two years. And again, I want to assure each and every member who's attending and who may hear from you that at college, every decision which is made is based on evidence, transparency, and fairly fair to everybody. So you can be absolutely sure that, uh, that those are our three fundamental uh, motives in making any, any decision, transparency, fairness, and based on evidence. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Harinder. I know we don't have a lot of time this evening to really go into some of your perspectives on, on these issues, but there will be lots of other opportunities to get you to, to know you as president of RCDSO. Um, and also as a professional, uh, I know you practice still and uh, your experiences that have framed a lot of your, your thinking today. I just have a couple of quick updates before we hear our next presentation. Uh, some of you may know that in an effort to bolster Ontario's health workforce and to improve health resource planning in emergency situations, the provincial government through the Ministry of Health has enacted the Pandemic and Emergency Preparedness Act 2022. So I wanna tell you a little bit about what that means. The ministry required all 26 of Ontario's health regulatory colleges to develop a new emergency class certificate of registration. And the aim of that is to reduce barriers for new applicants in emergency situations. The college drafted regulation amendments and they outlined the circumstances that are needed for the emergency class, as well as restrictions on practice. We had a consultation uh, on the regulation, the draft, and our consultation uh, has just closed and it will be discussed by council next week on April 4th. You can watch the meeting live uh, or you can read the materials that are posted to our website. And following approval, the draft regulation will be submitted to the government for its finalization. And the college will keep you posted on all developments. Finally, the college uh, will be submitting its College Performance Measurement Framework, or CPMF, to the Ministry of Health on March 31st. And this report, the CPMF as it's known, is a required annual report by all regulatory bodies, the 26 colleges, required to be submitted on an annual basis to the Ministry of Health. Through that report, we are able to demonstrate that we're meeting regulatory benchmark standards which is a big part of building public trust and confidence. And you'll be able to find a summary and the full report on our website in the next few days. Our transparency with this report is just one more way of demonstrating how we regulate and how we regulate effectively in the public interest. I'm gonna turn now to introduce our final session for this evening and to welcome the college's director of quality, Susan Taylor. We've heard from you, the participants, that the e-portfolio was in need of an update to address some technology challenges. So Susan will provide you now with an overview of the upcoming improvements to the e-portfolio platform, which will launch this spring. Susan? Thanks, Dan. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please. Thank you so much. And, and really, um, I, I can't tell you um, how much we appreciate the feedback that you've shared with us, um, whether it be through um, some of the, the challenges that you've faced in, in entering points into the portfolio um, or struggles that you've had in knowing where to put things. Um, all of that has gone into our background as, as we try to design a portfolio or design a platform that would really meet your needs. Um, we know that tracking uh, continuing education is a very complicated process and the nuances can be really hard to follow. And so one of the things that, that we thought was important as we designed a new e-portfolio was to have a, a way for dentists to be able to see how many points they actually have in every category and to be able to see that in real time. 
And so when you when you see your new e portfolio, what you'll be able to do is to actually get some real time um, uh, confirmation of points so that you would know at any given moment how many category one points you have, how many category two points you have, and how many category three. This is an area that, that we often found was a challenge when we were doing audits, where in our previous system, um, there wasn't any way to do that. And so, so dentists often finish their cycle thinking and, and in good faith thinking that they had completed all of their requirements only to find on audit that they were falling short in an area because they had actually miscategorized uh, one of their, their courses, for example. So our new, new e-portfolio will automate that and make it easier for you so that you don't have to be able to uh, remember all of those details. The other thing that we've heard um, time and time again, and, and I think if you were here in my office and looked around at all of the little pieces of paper that are on my desk, um, you would see that I, I share I share this where, you know, sometimes we have these little slips of paper and they end up in a, a box or they end up in a file folder. And then, you know, several years down the road when you're trying to find them because you're needing to produce them for an audit, it's almost impossible to find them. So with our new ePortfolio, you'll be able to upload that certificate and what gets uploaded into the ePortfolio becomes the, the document that we can look at to validate your um, attendance at a particular session or participation in a particular activity if we are um, called upon to, to do an audit for that particular event. And then uh, one of the other things that I just wanted to highlight is transcripts um, and records. We often find that dentists perhaps are looking um, for a transcript because they're perhaps looking for an academic appointment or maybe they're looking to register um, in another jurisdiction. And so they're looking for that transcript, that record of their continuing education. And so what our new ePortfolio will do for you is you'll be able to print that um, whenever you want to. Um, the other thing you'll be able to do is you'll be able to search courses. So you'll be able to search courses because you might say, gosh, I remember taking this really great course from a particular instructor and you can't remember the name of the course. So you'll be able to go into your ePortfolio and enter the name of the instructor and find the name of the course quite easily. Or maybe you want to know, um, you may be authorized under our uh, facilities inspection program uh, for sedation and you want to know, have you uh, completed enough sedation points to meet those requirements? you'll be able to go in and to search that in the ePortfolio in a way that's simple and easy, uh, easy to, to manage, and you're able to find that information in real time. Um, the next slide, please. The next couple of slides are, are screenshots of our prototype. So I do want to say um, these will change. These are the prototype. Um, it is still a, um, a work in progress, but I wanted to highlight a few things for you this evening. When you look at this, what you see is a really uh, crisp view of your activities. Um, and if you move uh, towards the middle of that table, you can see where it's clear what the activity date was, how many points you earned for a particular activity, whether they were in category one, two, or three, the points would appear in the relevant column. And then there will be a dashboard page for you that has a total of all of the points that you have so that you don't have to do the tallying. So for example, for this, this particular person, they've got a total of six category one points. On your dashboard page, it will have that total done for you. So you don't have to, to do that manually. Um, but then over on the right-hand side where that check mark is, where it's complete, that means that the course or the activity has been entered into the ePortfolio and our system has validated that what is there is um, sort of the official total, so to speak. So it will say, you know, you may have a situation where you thought something was uh, um, a category two, but it was actually a category one, and the system will allow that to happen automatically so that you don't have to, um, to know that, and it will check it off once it's been approved. Um, and then at the top, you'll see, or, or about midway through, um, where it says CE activity records and which cycle it is. Um, as with all of our CE cycles, the cycles haven't changed. Um, it is still a three-year cycle that begins in December, uh, on December 15th, and then ends on December 14th, three years later. You'll be able to search, though, um, by various cycles. So over time, um, as, you, um, as you participate in more and more cycles throughout the life of the portfolio, um, then you'll be able to search because you may find that um, 10 years down the road, you wanna go back and look to see what, what particular course you took on on a particular topic. So you'll be able to search by cycle as well. 
Our goal ultimately is to make it easy. And then once we've made it easier, we wanna make it even easier still. So we wanna keep going down that path. This is about um, us being able to um, collect the information that we need from a regulatory perspective to help you organize your um, continuing education learning so that you're able to um, engage actively in your professional development um, and continue that, that journey of learning. Um, and the next slide, please. So this one is, is really just to, to show you that from a, a, um, an entry perspective, you don't have to know what point, what category of points it is. You just need to know what kind of activity it is. And then based on the activity you enter, then the relevant fields will pop up. And so what that allows us to do is really streamline it for you so that you're not faced with um, a, a number of fields that you don't need to do anything with for a particular activity type. And so this will mean that if you enter um, teaching, only the fields relevant to a teaching activity will come up. It won't have any of the other fields. Or if, for example, you entered authorship because you authored an article, then the fields relevant to that will pop up. And then based on what you've entered, behind the scenes, the platform will have been designed, so or it is being designed, so that that will automatically tag it to the correct uh, number and type of points based on what you've entered. Um, and as I mentioned, there's space to upload your uh, verification documentation so that you don't need to keep it in a dusty box in your basement. Um, and the next slide, please. So next steps, um, we've been working with developers and, and I think it's important to, to just pause for a moment here to say that the development team we've been working with um, is a, a group that has worked with um, other health professional regulatory colleges um, here in Ontario. So they're very familiar with the type of work that, that, that we do um, and the types of requirements that a regulated health professional um, have under the, the regulations and, and the legislation. Um, they've been helping us to design a platform that meets our needs um, today, but will allow us to be flexible and meet our, meet our needs as we make future refinements. And those refinements will come from you based on your experience in working with the new ePortfolio. Um, we are on track to, to finish the development phase in April. And then once we have finished the development phase, um, we'll move into several um, cycles of testing in May. Um, one of the things that you'll see in the uh, follow up to tonight's session, there's a, a little survey that goes out at the end um, and there'll be a, an opportunity there for you to indicate if you would be interested in pilot testing. And I want to encourage you to to lean into that opportunity because we are really counting on on dentists to help us build uh, an e-portfolio that is easy to use and makes sense to you and will help you to organize your your continuing education records. Um, some of the things uh, as we move forward into May um, and uh, uh, prior to the launch in June, stay tuned and watch for information on our website and through our communications. Um, we will plan a series of live demonstrations. So those will be done um, uh, through Zoom like this, where we'll actually go through live demonstrations of how to enter various activities, that sort of thing. And it will be open to, um, to verbal dialogue and, and question and answer in real time. Um, we're also developing uh, frequently asked questions, some user guides that have uh, uh, screenshots to make it easy for you to, to be able to follow um, the instructions that go along with it. Um, and then we'll provide some direct messages to you as well to keep you informed. So we'll do some e-blast uh, type messaging uh, to keep you informed. We will start all of this in May, um, but it won't end in June. Um, uh, we will continue with, with this type of messaging, these types of education sessions. Uh, really throughout the year, because in all honesty, as, as we get closer to um, the December timeframe when, when cycles are ending, we know that's when a lot of people will be um, trying to get their e-portfolios um, finished up before their cycle ends. And so we will make sure that we have lots of opportunities for you to ask questions and to have that kind of support. We are here and, and we want to make this a successful uh, transition for you. Um, so, so that was the end of the presentation, but I did have a couple of questions that came in um, as you were registering for, for the session tonight. Um, and just very quickly wanted to, to, um, to answer a few of these. Um, again, I wanna thank you for your questions. Um, the questions you ask help us to know what you, what's on your mind and helps us to then um, adjust and to incorporate those ideas into what we're thinking. So the first question was around, um, why is there no credit for 15 minute or 30 minute time slots? And currently uh, credit is only given in one hour slots. 
And, and that is correct. Um, what we do at the college, which is a little bit different than some of the other regulatory colleges, is we round. So if somebody attends a 30 minute or say an hour and a half, we round it up to two, uh, two hours and they would get two points um, for that particular session. Um, and that has generally worked well for us. Um, we don't have the ability in our current system yet to track micro credits, which I know College of Physicians does. Um, there are some other, other regulatory colleges that look at those um, very short credits um, for, for very small activities that, that people might be participating in. We haven't had the types of activities um, that would require that. So at this time, um, our, our rounding seems to work reasonably well. Um, one of the things I will say is for activities like uh, a conference, what we do for that is um, the person tracks the hours that they attend. And then once the full day is completed, then we do the rounding to make it uh, to make it make sense based on their entire um, uh, participation throughout that event. Um, the second question was one around live versus virtual um, uh, continuing education and uh, that that continuing education that might be on your own time or a tape lecture. Um, and the question was, do we have a certain proportion of live CE? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, I do want to say though, that remembering that um, live can be live in person. So you're in a room and there's people physically around you, or it can be an event like this, which is live online. So we're live, we're online, we're physically in a, a, a virtual room through our, our webinar technology of Zoom. And so, so this would be considered a live session because we are, um, we are speaking, there are, um, there are some interactive components to it, there's polling, there's, um, you know, you're able to ask questions, those sorts of things, this would be considered live. Um, when there's uh, something that is delivered um, through either an e-learning platform, which is totally separate, so you go in and you do the course um, on your own time and you don't have any contact with a speaker or with um, uh, anybody from that course perspective, that is considered to be um, to be that e-learning, and that's a bit different. That falls under a different category um, than a live course. Um, but there is no uh, differentiation, for example, in category one. There are lots of people who may have all of their points as, as uh, live online points um, for, for their category one. And in fact, throughout COVID, that was often the case. Um, the third question uh, was a really important one. The question was around if we're specialized or focused in your practice, do we still need to take courses in those areas that perhaps you don't use? In this case, they, they use the example of restorative, um, but you could equally say that for, for really any, any of, of the competency areas. And I, I do want to remind, remind you that under, um, under the regulations, you are accountable for having that general knowledge in all areas of practice, even if it's not something that you might generally practice in on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you may be um, in a specialty practice, and so you may be an endodontist, and, and so that's where your practice is focused, but you still need to have a basic understanding of the other competency areas. You may not see patients that, that fall under or require those types of treatment, but you need to have that, that general understanding of it. Or you may be in general practice, and so in that case as well, you need to have a general understanding of all of the competency areas. Um, we do look at 15 competency areas with the practice enhancement tool um, assessment that you do every five years. Um, and when you do that, you are accountable for all of those, those areas and you are required to meet the minimum standards in those areas. And then the last one, um, the last question, I flagged it um, because I thought it was brilliant. Um, and I wanted to, to say a particular thank you to, to whomever has, has entered this in. Um, and what I love about this, this is the idea of having a QR code um, for the courses. So I'm imagining, you know, in a certificate that it would have a QR code on it. So instead of having to enter and type in all of that information, you just scan the QR code on your phone and it would magically appear in our e-portfolio. We're not anywhere near being able to do that at this point, but I wanna say these are exactly the sorts of things that we want to keep on our radar because as we continue to refine, um, I would love to see us move in this direction. Um, it won't be in the, the near future. It certainly won't be between now and June, but it's a really important idea. And, and I love having these ideas coming into us and really encourage you to keep doing that because that's what will help us to co-design the e-portfolio that works for us and for you. Um, so we'll work together on this. Um, I think I'm at time. So I wanna thank you for your, your time um, on this evening's agenda um, and uh, really appreciate your feedback. Thank you, Dan.
Harinder, you're on mute. Do you have any uh, closing comments? Well, I want to thank uh, the college staff, uh, Dan, you, and uh, our speakers, and all of the uh, attendants uh, who attended this uh, important session. It was a pleasure speaking with you, and we'll continue with these sessions. Uh, and please uh, don't hesitate to send questions if uh, there's no time today. We'll be very happy to answer, and uh, staff is always uh, ready to answer any question. Uh, we are making a concerted effort. Um, Mr. Faulkner is, uh, has taken upon him that we want to make sure that communication with the membership is open and as uh, readily available as possible. Thank you again, all of you. Thanks, Surrender. And uh, I hope the participants see that we are trying to show you the progress that we're making at the college on the various uh, areas that you've identified for us and how we've instructed this event with RCDSO Connect. As always, if you have any practice related questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to the staff in our, uh, the practice advisory service of the college. You can use the email practiceadvisory at rcdso.org. You can also follow, follow the college on social media to receive our latest news, updates, resources. And as I mentioned at the start of the session for the CE credit, you will need a reference number for the post-event survey. So it's going to be on the screen. And that reference number is 202-3001. In the survey, we'll also ask you how we can make these sessions better as we have been doing over the last two years and how we're doing as a college overall in our approach to being transparent. We wanna know what we can improve on so that we can support you and the care that you deliver to your patients. Our next college newsletter will arrive in your mailbox in April, and I encourage you to read it and get more details on what we're doing to meet our mandate to serve the public interest. I know some of you have expressed concerns in the past that we've gone over time, and I see that we're gonna finish up uh, a couple minutes early. So I hope there are no concerns with that. Thank you everybody for participating and then please enjoy the rest of your evening.